So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. Sinner be still, earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal, earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay Everybody. Welcome to Hope for Christian Church. We're glad you're here this morning. If you would stand, we're going to sing a song together. It's a throwback for me, and that doesn't say much because I'm a little bit younger. But I, I love this song, and it's so much fun. So um, if you know it, sing it out loud, um, and we'll just worship together this morning. Blessed be your name.
Hey, you guys can have a seat. Uh, my name's Todd. I'm the uh, lead minister here at Milford Christian Church. Glad that you guys are here with us this morning. Um, just wanted to say a special good morning to anybody who may be here with us for the first time. Um, if you're a recent guest with us or have been here maybe a couple of times, we would love to be able to connect with you and to, uh, to learn more about you so you can learn more about us. And uh, if you have a quick second, just uh, text your name to the phone number that's on the screen right now, um, or at the end of the service, you can, you can grab me or, or David Carey, who's heading up our first impressions, and just kind of jot down some information so we could be in touch with you and, and answer any questions that you might have. Um, I'm excited about this week. This week, we're going to be kicking off our midweek session. Um, it's a little bit different this year than what we've done in years past, but this Wednesday at 6 o'clock, we're going to have an adult um, study time here in this uh, worship center, and then in the FLC, we're going to have a, uh, an opportunity for our, our student ministry, our junior high, um, sixth grade through 12th grade to, to be able to meet. And since we've had these two services going on, we've kind of had a little bit of a gap with regards to some of our Sunday school programming. So this is going to help fill that void. Uh, but unlike last year and, and years past, we're not going to have a meal together. Um, this is just going to be a Bible study time. So we'll get to kind of feast on God's word. Um, together. Um, And there's also no children's programming or nursery programming. Um, They're getting a lot of their stuff on Sunday mornings, and so we're kind of using that time to to, to set up a chance for adults and for our student ministry to to kind of jump back into the pool, if you will. So that starts this Wednesday. It's going to continue on through November the 18th. Um, It's kind of a shortened session, but uh, we're excited to be able to do that together. So we want to invite you out to that. Um, Also, our life groups, um, a lot of them have kicked off. Um, Some are starting this week. We want to give you an opportunity if you would like to be a part of a life group. There's um, a stack of cards that are out in the foyer area on the table that list out our life groups. And some of this has changed a little bit. We've got some groups merging together that are meeting here. Um, The majority of our life groups are meeting here at the building so we can can kind of space um, out accordingly with one another and and, um, still have a a good opportunity to to fellowship and to to learn and and to be in God's Word together. So um, take a look at those if you're interested. Um, The last thing is that we are still heading into the end of the year where we're taking nominations for our our leaders. Um, There are nomination forms that are out in the foyer as well that that give you kind of a a listing of the qualifications for the different leaders that we're talking about. So please take some time and prayerfully consider those names, and uh, you can turn those into the office between now and the end of October. So um, I think that's all that we have to kind of get caught up, so I'm going to kick it back to Colton, and uh, we'll have some more time uh, celebrating together. Today our theme is worship, and one of the things that I've noticed about worship, especially in my life, is that a lot of the songs we sing and the attitudes that we have is we praise God for what he has done for us instead of just for praising God for who he is. Um, And so this next song we're going to sing is a new song um, to the congregation. Uh, If you watched our live stream on Wednesday, I introduced this song to us. Um, It's just a song declaring who God is and praising God for being God. And I think it's super important that that's that's a part of our worship as well. So if you would stand, um, we're going to sing this new song. If you know it, sing with me. If you don't, listen to the words and just praise God for who he is. Thank you. 
Congregation, you guys can go ahead and have a seat for just a minute. Um, while we're doing that, the, the band's going to exit the stage. Um, in just a moment, we're going to be celebrating around the Lord's table together. We're going to share in a time of communion. And what we're going to do this week is something very similar to what we did last week, where we intentionally did some things to kind of focus in on the communal aspect of this. And so um, in just a minute, I'm going to ask that you guys, um, while Colton sings a, a song, um, to come forward and to take the, uh, the cup that has the juice and the bread together. 
um, from uh, the front stations that are up here, and then just return to your seat. Hold on to that. Don't take it, because we're going to do this all together once again. And so um, this is going to be a great time for us as family to do this, uh, for our families to do this together. And then when we're finished uh, with our time of, of communion, then our kids are going to be dismissed. The elementary st- uh, school kids are going to be heading downstairs. So um, we're going to go ahead and, and hear the song, and then while that's playing, come on up and then return to your seats with the cup, and we'll, we'll spend some time together. This past week, um, I had that dreaded experience of going to the eye doctor. Um, It had been about four years since I've done that, and it made me think of there's a comedian named Brian Regan who talks about why do we put this off for so long when we could have better eyesight. Um, But I was one of those people, and in the midst of COVID, no better time to do that than now. So I went to the eye doctor, and what I found that was interesting was that everything is so mechanical now from the last time that I was there. They they kind of have all of these, these machines lined up, and of course, you know, you're keeping distance and everything like that. But the machines are kind of like doing all of their job, and the person that's running them is kind of instructing me on how to do things. And I go through all of these machines, and the doctor comes in and, and basically does the, you know, A, B, which is better, one, two. We did that dance for a little while. And then finally he said, hey, your eyesight hasn't changed. And I'm like, I went through all of that for no difference, except for one thing. Um, I now need bifocals. And... Um, 
Thank you for your pity. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, you know, but what was interesting was this, you know, you go through all of these things and, and, and how important vision is in order to um, not just to see but to operate and, and um, kind of take that for granted sometimes. And, and I was thinking about all of this in light of what I knew Colton was going to be singing this morning about having this vision of Christ, of him being that central component, that central person, that central um, Lord that we come to every every Sunday and we celebrate at this time. And, and regardless of whether you are a good singer or you think your prayers are horrible, this is a moment where we gather together and we worship at the table and we remember and we think back to, to what Christ did on the cross. And I was thinking in particular about a passage in John chapter 19 where Jesus is before Pilate. And Pilate says some things that are very interesting about Jesus. At one point, Jesus is brought out and he's been kind of made a mockery of. And, and he, he's dressed like a king, but his crown is made of thorns. He's been beaten. He's wearing this purple sash. And they're basically making this mockery of like, hey, this is, this is your king. Doesn't he look great? And Pilate says something interesting. He says, look at this man or behold the man. Take a look at him. And then a few moments later, he says, look at your king. And in this moment, we kind of see some things about Jesus, that as he is humble, as he's doing this um, on our behalf, we, we have this chance at this time to look at him, to think about what the cross was all about, to think about what he went through. But not just to look at him, but to look to him, to realize that God was at work beyond that day to bring about something even greater, that we look to him for the salvation that that act does and and then lastly we also we look we, we we see through him we see this idea of of seeing the world through the lens of jesus of being able to see our own lives and see the lives of people around us and so this meal is so important because it allows us the chance not just to to hold things in our hands and to see them to taste them but to remember and to see jesus for who he is to to go to him and so i, I want to ask that we just take the bread at this time, and together we're going to remember the body that was broken. And, and in this moment, just to think about what it is to look at Christ, to look to Christ, and to see the world through him. Let's take this together. And Father, we give you thanks and we praise you for this act of remembrance that we have, for these, these emblems that represent so much more than just just bread and juice. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you that we have this time that we can celebrate and that we can worship together at your cross, at your table. Even thinking about the empty tomb and, and how this meal gives us hope. And so, Father, at this time, we're going to take the cup and we thank you for the blood that was given on our behalf. We thank you for the new covenant that has come, that is open to all, that your table is open to everyone, that we might come and meet with you and remember you, and give you thanks. So, Lord, as a family, we think about the body, not just your body that was broken, not just about ourselves and what that means, but the body of Christ that's meeting here. And we celebrate this meal together to say thank you. Thank you for loving us and for giving us the opportunity to choose to love you in return. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's drink of the cup together. I want you guys to hold on to these for now. We're going to dispose of these uh, when we leave. And at this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our youngest worshipers um, who are going to head down with Miss Amy to their, uh, to their classes. So I believe she's back in the foyer. Yeah, there we go.
How's everyone doing this morning? I'm doing well, yeah. We are here continuing our sermon series, The Church Defined, and understanding what it looks like. And today, as, as Colton had mentioned earlier, that it, we are really focusing on worship today, right? Not just, not just things that we sing, but what worship really looks like, right? So what does it look like to be a community of worshipers? And I started working on that and, and taking it apart, and, uh, and I came across this thing. It's, it's pretty funny. I've seen it years ago, um, but Todd and, uh, and Jake had sent me this, this Instagram follow a, little, a couple months back. It's called Worship Fails. And it's all these videos of where things happen during a worship service that just don't happen to be right. Now, I got one of them. It's one of my favorites. If we can go ahead and show that video, that'd be great. Raise your hands if you've seen that before. Has anyone seen that before? A couple of you. It's, it's great. I love the one guy in the crowd's like, something's gone wrong. And the bass player, he's like picking up pieces of the, the top that have fallen apart. I think of what worship fails, and, and I, I look at that, and I started thinking about times in my life where I've led worship and things have not gone right, wrong, where we, we have had uh, worship fails in, in my leading, and it and I've had many, but one sticks out in particular, and that was when I was leading at camp, our junior high camp, uh, several years ago. And at camp, when we do our worship, we have we kind of worship in this pole barn looking thing. There's no sides, and and so we're out in the hot mists and muck, and it's rainy and nasty and everything else. And uh, it was about Thursday night. My voice had been there, then it went away, and then came back, and you know, I'm just getting through the set, we're having a good time, we're bouncing up and down, and, and singing, and, uh, and I like to, when I sing, I, I, you shouldn't do this, but I like to put my mouth on the microphone, and I remember this one time, we're popping around, jumping, and I, when I went to go back to sing to the microphone, it wasn't there, it was here, and I go, okay, that's weird. And then I realize slowly that this thing is coming right back at me. And so I could sit there and go, well, I can duck and move out of the way, or I could just take it. And so I took it, boom, right into my teeth. Oh, it hurts so bad. It actually nicked a, a part of a, I had a, had a chip that they had replaced, and that enamel kicked off and everything else. And, and I continued to worship, but I did the, the classic performer's thing is, it's because I couldn't sing at that point. I just grabbed the microphone out and I just held it out in the crowd. And just let them sing, oh yeah, oh yeah, right? Worship fails. We, too many times in our lives, we see things like this and we laugh. And I'm really, honestly, I'm not wor- worried about worship failures like this. And, and doing worship on a weekly basis, you sit there and understand, well, man, things aren't going to go right. And I always try to tell my musicians, look, it doesn't matter how you begin the song or how you are in the middle. If you nail the ending, it's all perfect, right? No one remembers how bad it was. But I don't really worship about or worry about worship fails as much as I worry about churches that fail to worship. See, a lot of times when we think of the word worship, we think of what we just did. Some of you guys probably thought that, like, okay, we're, we, we just did what you're saying. We got it. Really easy. Move on. But no, what we did was praise. Worship is so much more multifaceted than that. And today we're going to look at what that looks like. What, what does that mean to worship God and be a true worshiper of God? We're going to walk what we can do to really create this new lifestyle of worship That's beyond what we do here on a Sunday morning. And so that's what I want to bring you to, and it's bringing me to my first point is this. Worship is not intended only to be on Sunday morning. Worship is not intended only to be between 9 and 10 or between 11 and 12 on Sunday mornings, or maybe even Wednesday nights. 
Worship was never intended for a specific time at all. But often, we have just regimented that into our lives. A lot of times we think about, well, the only time I can really truly worship are places where I can really be comfortable and let myself go. I remember taking students to CIY conferences and, and being having a whole week of just really intense worship. And I was like, this is amazing. This is what worship should be like. And the reality is, no, that's a, a way of worshiping. That is not what worship really is. You can trace worship and praise back uh, through the Old Testament really easy, right? We, we have all sorts of different ways. We have sacrifice, we have um, praise. The Psalms, right? Those were, those were songs that were written to be sung aloud. And, and the reality is that those were done in temple worship, yes. But when the, the Jews were taken into captivity, do you think they were allowed to have temple worship? No. So how did those psalms preser- be preserved? Because they were singing them to each other. They were encouraging them with each other. They were teaching them to each other and learning from them. Worship is, has a rich history, and it doesn't have to do with just Sunday. It's interesting, if you look back to Abraham and when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, and I read through the scripture this week, it doesn't say that it was on a Sabbath or on the Sabbath to do it. He said, on a day, <laughs> I want you to go and sacrifice your son to me. And it's funny, when he was walking, walking up with, with his son and, and, the, and their servant, he told the servant at one point, you stay right here, we are going to go worship God. It wasn't a particular day. It wasn't anything scheduled about it. Because we have to understand that worship is more than just singing. It's more than just playing music. The act of worshiping is really acknowledging the greatness of God and dedicating your actions and attitudes to him and being able to represent yourself for him to others. Worship is is so much more than than what we just do here on a Sunday morning. I love it. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in views of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. doesn't say anything in there about how well you can sing, how good you can play an instrument, how high you can hold your hands. What's it talk about? Sacrificial living as your act of worship. And when I sit there and I think, how do, how do we live a sacrificial lifestyle? What does that look like? As a parent, sometimes we understand that really well. There's sometimes that you sacrifice things for your children, sometimes just so they don't cry and nag you all the time, right? I'm not sure if I've watched what I really wanted to watch on TV in a long time. I got to watch the Bearcats game yesterday, but... Most of the time, we're watching some Doc McStuffins or some other show that they want to. And yeah, that's a little tiny sacrifice. But a sacrificial lifestyle is so much more. And the only way that we can do this is to really embody who Jesus is. Because Jesus was all about sacrifice. That's what his mission was here for us. Todd mentioned this a couple weeks ago, and we see it in Scripture. He he said, we need to learn to put on Christ, to clothe ourselves with him, so that he shines through and not just our own bodies. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, it says this, Therefore, and by the way, I know I've mentioned this before, anytime you see the word therefore, get your highlighter out, or tap your your app to underline, because that's the meat of the passage. Here we go. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. You get that? 
We are supposed to clothe ourselves with all these characteristics, all these, all these things that describe what Jesus did for us. He was compassionate. He had kindness. He had humility to step down from the heavenly realm as king to walk amongst us. He was gentle. He had patience, and he still has patience with us. And he forgave. So I think oftentimes we don't think about the act of forgiveness and how that can be an act of worship, do we? To forgive someone and to break that bondage of all those feelings, the hurt feelings, that's truly freeing. And Jesus, when he, when he forgave us, weren't we thankful for that? We need to learn to forgive each other, to walk in those ways to be Jesus to everyone else. But I don't think we understand that fully. About 15 years ago or so, I read a book from David Crowder. David Crowder is one of our, uh, probably one of our bigger uh, songwriters, worship and songwriters. We sing a lot of their songs here um, uh, for worship. And he he was writing this book, it's called Praise Habits. And I I will be honest, I've read it, and it's not a, it's an okay book, uh, you know. So it's, I got done reading and said, it's a good thing he's a worship leader, you know. <laughs> but as I read through it uh, this week, because there was something in there I remember that I liked, he talked about in this intro of why he chose the name Praise Habit. And he understands, he goes, I want us to be in habits and building new, new ways that are just naturally forming for us. We all have different habits. Most of us can name our bad habits, but we have trouble naming our good habits, right? You know your bad habits really well. But he then changed it. He, he, he changed, he said, I really want to, he looked at the word habit and what it means. And he first saw that, but then he talked about, he saw that habit is a, is a dress, a headdress that nuns wear, a piece of clothing. And it instantly kicked this idea to him. And he says this, he writes in his book, a nun does not get up each morning and go to the closet and think to herself, hmm, I wonder what to wear today. The habit is what she wears. It is what, she co- what covers her. It is what identifies her. Our condition is the, is the same. Our habit is the Christ. He is what covers us. He is what identifies us. We wear him into every moment. And when, and when we live with this awareness, we praise Christ. Think about that. A nun, every morning she goes and wears that. She knows that is her dressing. Each and every day, we don't do that. But we can. We can start doing that. Now, I'm not saying to rush to like Amazon and start ordering yourself a habit, okay? You don't, I'm not telling you to do that. But today we're going to figure out how can we spiritually set our minds up for that? How can we do these things, make these changes in our lives so that way worship is no longer just something that we do on a Sunday, but it's something that we do every moment of every single day. In Colossians, it continues, verse 15, it says this, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since members of one body you are called to one peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you as richly, or richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it, all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Man, I love that. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. As we are a community of of worshipers, peace should rule in our hearts. We should be unified under Christ. Does that mean that we're going to get in arguments? Absolutely we will. But if we can agree on Christ, we can get over all that. If we're clothing ourselves with Christ, we should be able to, to get past those initial agreements. We should be able to talk to each other and love. I think we're in a society right now where we don't know how to disagree with each other civilly, do we? I mean, just even just think about your own family situation. Brother or sister, do you guys fight like crazy? I know I still do. We're supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to be able to be willing to listen willing to learn, willing to lift other people up. 
But I love this in verse 17. And if you need a life verse, go ahead and underline this one. You can take it for free. It says, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Anything you do, whatever you do, you dedicate that to Jesus Christ. That is worship. That is how we are to live. That everything we do just works and promotes and understanding that I'm doing this not for my own good, not for really the good of others, but really the reason why you're doing this is to glorify God, to be Jesus and to show Jesus to other people. In this dog-eat-dog world, we, we have a lot of different things, right? We have a lot of menial tasks that we may have to, to do every day. Whether, whether that's like paperwork or the dishes each night, taking out the garbage, reporting to managers. We have to change our mindset and focus that what we are doing is not just for the job is to glorify our Lord. And the best way we can do it is by doing it with excellence for him. Several years ago, before I, I, when I graduated from uh, CCU and I was looking for a job, I took a median job at, during, at, at Lowe's and I was working there. And uh, I worked in the seasonal department. The seasonal department's kind of got like all the lawn equipment, but they also are the people that right now have Christmas decorations up in October. Have you seen that lately? Yeah, that's, that's what, what I would do. You'd go in and you reset all these bars and you'd work early in the morning. And there was this other guy that I worked with and he was very gung-ho about Lowe's and he really wanted to climb that Lowe's corporate ladder. And, uh, and he was a nice guy, but he's kind of a little overzealous sometimes. And I remember one time we were just kind of walking by, walking down the, the aisle way and, uh, and we were walking and talking and I just kind of like shoved him, boom. You know, like, hey, man, boom. And when I shoved him, the district manager walked around. Now, you know, the, di- the district manager's guy's in charge of all the stores in this area, and his office was in our building. And when I shoved him, he, like, like my friend just kind of stopped me. He's like, dude, what are you doing? That's a, that's, that's a district manager right there. What, what are you doing? Don't, don't, don't make me look dumb. Don't make me look stupid. And I said, so what? Is, it, it's the district manager. No big deal. Well, he's the one that, that hires and, and fires, and he's the one who moves people up and down, and you should really wor- worry about him. I said, no, I, I don't worry about him because I don't work for him. He said, what, what do you mean? I said, I work, everything I do, I work for Jesus. Uh, if there is a person that's ahead of me, and I'm working for Jesus, and what I'm doing is so well that that person promotes me, glory to God. Not glory to Jimmy. And he had a hard time understanding that. And it's because he wasn't a follower. And as Christians, I think we have a hard time understanding that. I'd love to say, raise your hand here and tell me if you've had a problem with your boss, but I think everybody's hands would be up at this point, right? You want to get mad, you can get frustrated, but the truth is that if you start working and your attitude is that I'm going to serve Jesus and how I work today, you're able to get by those little things. You're able to really be putting on Jesus as clothing. Brings me to our second point is this. A lifestyle of worship begin, begins by putting God in his rightful position. Hopefully you've gathered some of this, but this is something we talk about a lot and we don't practice very well. We need to put God in his rightful position. God is king. Amen? Jesus is king. I am not. When Jimmy is king, things don't go well. Anybody else agree with that? (laughs) Not just Jimmy, yourselves. You can put your own names in there, right? (laughs) When I'm in charge, I don't make great decisions. But when I let Jesus rule, that's when I do well. Because my heart is after his heart. And my heart goes after the things that aren't very natural to me, like patience and kindness and forgiveness. But when I'm in tune with him, it's a wonderful thing. Someone once said that when you bow your knee to God, you stand straight before men. Isn't that beautiful? The idea that the more you can exalt God, the more you can humble yourself and be able to worship him, you'll be able to stand upright in front of others around you. 
See, if you're worshiping God, you should be able to see the difference in your own attitude as you work throughout the day. You should be able to get over little tiny things and they shouldn't have as big of an impact because you know God can make good of all situations. I was reading uh, C.S. Lewis's reflections on the Psalms this week and he was talking about how he was an atheist and as when he was an atheist, he really had a problem that the scriptures had talked about how God demands our praise. It's like, what loving God demands praise? You know, what, a, what an egotistical God that would demand praise. But as he started following and understanding and and really paying attention to other followers of Christ, and he saw how they worshipped God, and the enjoyment and the the reactions that they had, he started to change. And he started looking, he goes, how is it that, that people can look at an inanimate object like a painting, and everyone just appreciate what that painting is? how beautiful it, can, it became and the feelings and emotions that it can create. And it's not even a living thing. And then he started understanding, well, now if I, can, if I can worship that, I can worship a creator God. He says this, the, Scot- the Scottish Catechism says that man's chief end is to glorify God and, in, and to enjoy him forever. But we shall then know that these are the same thing. To fully enjoy is to glorify. And commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. When you start celebrating God, you start really getting like a part of of who he is. It's the same thing like if you are watching a football game, that's not the Bengals because they're not very good, Um, Ohio State. Like if you're watching Ohio State with a bunch of other Ohio State fans and they do something well, what does everyone do? They stand up and cheer together, right? We don't see that as much with the Bengals, but it's okay. Maybe today. Maybe. When we're able to see something glorious, we can enjoy it and we can just gather around it. And when you are in your mundane life, how can you enjoy God? By the little things. By thanking him for the little things that you have. Thank you, Lord, for this pen that writes. Because we all know how frustrating it can be when you go to write with a pen that doesn't, right? Mm Mm-hmm, exactly. See, I I think a lot of times we don't like to to celebrate the other things in life. And we forget sometimes to celebrate the good things that we have done in the Lord's name. We forget about the amazing things that he provides us with. And honestly... C.S. Lewis had, had, had said that when he started looking at himself and the other atheists at the time, he realized how, how critical and ne- negative they were and how these followers of Christ were just always so happy and joyful. And I don't know about you, but we are in a very critical society, aren't we? We criticize every little thing and something either has to be right or wrong. But it doesn't have to be like that. I remember years ago when American Idol first started. Remember that? Long, long time ago. And these, the, all, uh, in the youth groups that I was working with, all the kids, oh, so, so, so great, blah, 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 blah. You know, they're, they talk about this. And, and I would, I would sit there and like downplay them. Like, oh, they're okay, but they sing through their, their chest voice and through their nose, so they won't make it very far. I like acted like I was this like, you know, amazing, wonderful singer. And the reality was when I would watch these people perform, I was jealous of them. Anybody else been like that before? Maybe a new band came out and everyone likes them. You're like, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to like them. They're, they can't be that good. I mean, I'm, I, I, sh- I deserve better than them, right? So there's the, that pride has just built up in you. And, and how you get rid of pride is you celebrate others. You don't shine light on your pride because it'll grow bad, right? Instead, you shine light on other people and it'll make it shrink and go away. We have to be willing to put God in his rightful place and let us live and enjoy being underneath that. And let's bring other people along to that. When people are having a bad day that we know our fellow Christians say, hey man, let me share with you what God's telling me right now. Hey, it's okay, God's with us, we can take care of it, we can pray. We don't don't do that, we don't take those extra steps. 
So you might be thinking to yourself, well, what's next? How can, Jimmy, how can I do this? Okay, I've, I've heard this before. I've been to church a long time. I know worship's more than just singing praise. What are some steps that I can really do to get to this point and to get to this, this moment? And one thing that, that I have done in the past and this week and something that I should challenge you all to do is this. Is ask this question. Do the people around me know that I love Jesus? Ask yourself that question. Do the people around me know that I love Jesus? If you say no, then you understand you've got work to do. You've got to start moving and making some changes in your life. If the answer to that is yes, that's amazing, because you're probably one of those people that this comes very natural to. There are some people that God has just built in a worship heart and worship mindset, and that you're able to just glorify God in every little moment. I'll be honest, that's not me. I have to work towards this. And I'm assuming that a lot of you do too. So how to create a life of worship? First thing, and uh, I'm glad Todd did some Sunday school answers last week, because here's one. Start with prayer. Start with prayer. And I, I'm going to challenge you this. Start every morning with prayer. I know some of you people are like me, and you are more nighttime people, so you like to do your devotions at night. But the reality is we should begin, we should start every morning by thanking our creator for giving us life and, and, and asking him to sustain us and to build us up and ask him to, be clo- to clothe ourselves with him. We got to start with prayer. When I was at CCU, there was this guy who, uh, he worked in the uh, cafeteria, his name was Fred, and Fred seemed to be always happy, and uh, uh, young Jimmy goes, well, <laughs> who is happy? Who would be happy working in a cafeteria? Like, I know these kids he's serving. They're not great, you know. I love them all, but come on. And the food wasn't always great. So you always heard people complaining about the food. But he was always happy. And I remember a group of my friends were there, and we were going through one time. My one friend was like, hey, Fred, how, how come you're always so happy? And he said, fellas, I'll tell you what I do. He says, every morning I say, dear Heavenly Father, when I wake up. And when I go to bed at night, I say, amen. My whole life is a prayer to him. And I was just like, you know, I'm I'm taking theology classes and I just got hit with a big truth bomb, right? Right? Understand that prayer shapes everything. And we got to start with prayer. We need to be able to set our minds strictly towards prayer the glorification of Jesus Christ. Second thing is this, seek out the goodness of God in the normalcy of life. You have to seek out the goodness of God in the normalcy of God. Back in the 90s, they used to have these really cool pictures that had all these wavy lines and stuff. And if you looked at it long enough, eventually your eyes would tune in and you'd see a 3D picture. Does anybody remember those? Yeah, some of you have, some of you don't. And, and, and you'd sit there and you'd stare and stare and you'd try, try to make your eyes go cross. But finally you would see that, that 3D picture because you tuned your eyes in. People, we, we need to tune our eyes into what the goodness is that God is doing around us. We need to stop focusing on the negative. Stop focusing on the critical. And start praising God every single day. If you're in the middle of a meeting and something hits you in your, in your head that, wow, that's a beautiful you know, tree outside. Lord, thank you for giving us trees. For providing a way to giving us oxygen. And that's, that's, a, that's an idea of praise. There's something that I, I, I've done before, I've done again. Is, uh, I call, it's like the alphabet of praise. Something you can go through. It's just a simple practice. Just in your help, you can say, God is A. What, what would be an A word that describes God? What is, what is awesome? God is, someone's B, beautiful. And you just work your way through. Next thing you know, you spent five minutes meditating on the greatness of what God is. And that will realign how you are living and how you are working that day. There's ways of tricking that. Number three is hard. It's something that we all should look to is this. to so look to grace, peace, and forgiveness rather than judgment and dissension. This world is all about judging each other and tearing each other apart, isn't it? But a, a, a community of worshipers, we're about bringing unity together. About reaching across and showing the love of Jesus to other people. 
learning how to disagree in a loving way, learning how to correct in a loving way, learning how to cry and lean on each other in a loving, Christ-like way. We need to learn to forgive, to let go of those, those hard feelings. Four is difficult too, something I know i constantly wrestling with, constantly struggling with, is this keep a rein on your tongue. I'd say raise your hands, but I'm sure we'd all be right there, right? We, it's almost like this world has flipped what we should do when it comes to, to words and talking and, and dis- discussion. See, we should be talking about how wonderful and marvelous Jesus is, and we should be talking about what he has done to save other people. But instead, when we get into our circles and our groups, whether it be at, that be at you know, your, your home, if that's at work, if that's maybe like the other parents on the sports teams, or if that's other, some sort of club that you're in, what's the first thing you really start talking about? The gossip, right? The stuff that, that's, that's, oh, did you hear? Did you take the, don't tell anyone I said this, but, right? We, we, we ravel and we roll around in that filth like a pig instead of showing the glory and talk about the great things that Jesus has done for you. It'd be amazing to see a community of believers be able to go to each other and sing to each other and tell each other and say, look, man, let me tell you what God has been doing in my life. A great question, if you want to grow closer to God and as a community, a great question to ask each other is this, what is God teaching you today? Because when you get asked that, you automatically have to start assessing your day and going back through and say, what is he teaching me? And guess what? That's putting your mindset back on the glory that is God. That is worshiping him. The last thing is this. Create a physical reminder to glorify God. In the 90s, we all wore a, a bracelet, right? 90s, early 2000s. What was on that bracelet? What did it say? WWJD. Some of you guys who are not Christians, you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. We would wear these bracelets that were woven and said WWJD. Just ask a question, what would Jesus do? It was a physical reminder that, that set us in place every single day. And if you are having a bad day, you could look at that and you learn to overcome and set your mind on higher things other than the muck and mire that you might be in. It's interesting, I, I came across this and found this out. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, when he would write his music, he would always sign it at the end, but above his signature, he would write SDG. And I got a picture of it right there. SDG. Does anybody have any idea what that means? stands for it's sole deo gloria which means glory to god alone there were many actually many uh composers who did this at the time and so what he was saying that anything this artwork or this work does all the glory of it goes to god not to me not to my name but it's interesting we don't find that a lot in our textbooks, do we? Many of you guys have had probably watched tons of History Channel episodes about things like this, and you probably have never heard of that. It's because the evil one doesn't want glory to go to God. He wants you to try to consume as much glory as possible so you can fail. My one last challenge for you is this. There's times where we worship together. And I know this happens. Sometimes you'll look around the room and you go, oh, well, that person's not worshiping very good. Why is it, oh, that person, well, she, oh, she's putting her hands up again. We judge each other on how we worship, even in this room. And if we can't get worship right here, what makes us think we can get worship right out there? I'll tell you this last thing. My mom is like, she loves praise and worship she lifts, she's the one that lifts her hands. She claps, stomps her, stomps her feet. If she could run up and down the aisle, she would, but she's got two knee replacements. So uh, she doesn't do that. My dad is the exact opposite. He, does, he knows he, he doesn't sing very well. He's the one that goes, yeah, you can give me a solo, you know. I'll sing solo, you can't hear it, you know. Or, I'm a tenor, 10 or 15 miles from here. He knows his, his limitations. And he just, he doesn't feel comfortable singing out loud. 
So instead, he reads the words and he ponders them in his heart. And my question to you is this, which one's worshiping God more? They're both worshiping God. So we need to not be so judgmental when we look around and we see someone raising their hand and someone being quiet. Because we each worship God in our own way. So my question for you is this. How are you going to worship this week? How are you going to go from here and worship as a lifestyle all day long? Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for giving us everything that we need. We thank you for providing us the talents and the abilities that we have for giving us strength when things don't go right. Lord, we ask that you remind, that, that on our minds that we are constantly clothing ourselves with Christ and understand that every interaction we have with someone is an opportunity to show them who Jesus really is. And that that way, it can glorify you more and more. Let us have a heart of praise and let us live a worship lifestyle. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to stand back up, and if you have a decision that you want to be made, we'd love to invite you down during this last song. But uh, don't let the worship stop here this morning. For the last song, our song of invitation, we're going to sing the heart of worship, and the chorus line reads like this. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. And my challenge to you is, I don't want you to stand if that's not your heart of worship. I want you to sit. I want you to raise your hands. I want you to stand and be quiet. I want you to go into your place of worship where you worship Jesus best because I want this to be all about Jesus. Music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless words, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart 
I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I want to thank you all for worshiping with us today. If you could take your communion cups that you have, we have two trash receptacles right as you leave back there. Please throw those away with us. Let's go ahead and pray and we can be, have a good week. Father God, you are amazing. You are wonderful. And we lift up your name in all circumstances. We love you, Lord. Be with us and guide us. And let us be able to shine your light to other people around us this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a good week.